welcome once again to our pilgrimage through the Catechism. I'm Mike Scherslick. It's great to be with you. For in this lesson, we are going to cover paragraphs 1066 through 1209, 1209, and there you will learn about the liturgy and the sacraments. And we're really going to focus on three parts in this section. Understanding the liturgy better, as well as understanding the nature of a sacrament, and then lastly, how do we understand the liturgical year? So it, those three things we're going to focus on in this session. But let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we hit a real milestone in this session because we've left part one, and now we're entering part two of the catechism devoted to the liturgy, the mass, and the sacraments. So as you turn in your paragraph to paragraph 1065, and then you look at the next page, you have a picture. And I just wanted you to know that there are four pictures in this catechism. So if you're getting overwhelmed with the paragraphs, there are a few pictures. But this picture is significant. It's an image of Jesus healing the woman with the hemorrhage. The woman who suffered for many years, went to many doctors, found no help. She hears about Jesus. And she thinks, if I can just get close enough to him to touch him, I'll be healed. And so she makes her way through the crowd. She reaches out. She just grasps the tassel of his cloak. And power goes forth from his body to heal her. Power goes forth from his body to heal her. In the last few lessons, we've learned that after Pentecost, the church is the body of Christ. And power still goes forth through his body to heal us. Now, in the liturgy and the sacraments. Power goes forth from the body of Christ, which is the church, to heal and to nourish and to give his life to us through his body in the sacraments. In the sacraments. And so this image here in the Catechism signifies the divine and saving power of the Son of God who heals us through His body, the Church, in the sacraments. In the sacraments. So now let's turn to 1069. And it begins with an understanding of the liturgy. What does the liturgy mean? What is the word liturgy mean? And there in 1069, there in 1069 it says, the liturgy means a participation of the people of God in the work of God. Liturgy is a participation of the people of God in the work of God. Well, what's the greatest work of God? It's easy. The suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ which saves us from the power of Satan and the power of death, and he transfers us to the kingdom of his Father. The Paschal mystery, the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus, this is the greatest work of God. So somehow, the liturgy and the sacraments are going to enable us to take part in that work, that saving work, so that what Christ did then can take place in us now and continue to transform us, to transform us. Right here, 1084 through 1089 are really your key paragraphs. 1084 through 1086. 1084 through 1086 are your key paragraphs. So as you turn there, that section... Notice the heading. The headings are always key. You always want to pay attention to the 
the headings, the subheadings, and the cross-references, these are all providing you the context for the points being made in the Catechism. Notice that heading right above 1084, Christ's work in the liturgy. And along the side, that left-hand side, you see the cross-reference. Notice 519. Notice 519. The Catechism is telling us that if we really want to grasp the points being made about the liturgy, we have to go back to this section 519, 520, and 521 of the Catechism. Because the Catechism is going to start tying things together that you learned in part one. It's going to tie it together and really make sense through part two. So as you go back to 519, I want you to turn back there. I want you to follow along with me. There's a couple of things I want you to highlight here. 519 tells us that he, Jesus, remains ever in the presence of God on our behalf, bringing before him all that he lived and suffered for us. You see that line? The point it's making is this. Jesus is an eternal person. That doesn't mean Jesus is really, really old. Eternal means always present. There's no past, there's no future, there's only the present. And every event from the life of Jesus remains present. Now you go on to 520. 520 tells us that in all of his life, Jesus presents himself as our model. And that we're supposed to do the best we can to live in imitation of Jesus and become like him. But I don't know about you, I don't do such a good job by my effort and power alone to imitate Jesus. In fact, by my power alone, I get almost nowhere. And if we're just going to rely on our effort and power alone, we're going to become very discouraged in this effort to become like Jesus. So there's got to be another way. There's got to be a better way to go about this. This is exactly the point the Catechism is making. Yes, you're supposed to become like Jesus, but there's another way, another way. 521 provides that other way. 521 says that Christ enables us to live in him all that he himself lived. Now, isn't this surprising? And he lives it in us. Christ enables us to live in him all that he himself lived, and he lives it in us. By his incarnation, he, the Son of God, has in some way united himself with each man. We are called only to become one with him, for he enables us, as the members of his body, to share in what he lived for us in his flesh as our model. But there's a further point, and this indented portion, which is a quote from St. John Oudes, is really astounding, and you have to pay close attention to this. That indented portion under 521, we must continue to accomplish in ourselves the stages of Jesus' life and his mysteries, and often to beg him to perfect and realize them in us and in the whole church. For it is the plan of God to make us and the whole church partake in his mysteries and to extend them to and continue them in us and in his whole church. This is the plan for fulfilling his mysteries in us. Three times it speaks of the mysteries of Jesus. What are the mysteries of Jesus? Well, it's a bunch of stuff you'll never be able to understand. No, it's crazy. Well, why would the catechism be telling us things we couldn't understand? The whole point of the catechism is so we understand. The mysteries. What are the mysteries of the rosary? They're the events from the life of Jesus. Every time you see mystery here, it's speaking about the events from the life of Christ. The events from his life. Now, 
Here's the main point. And it's quite, a, it's, it's quite amazing. Jesus wants to make, is going to make, does make the events from his life present. In the liturgy and through the sacraments so that we can enter into these events, take part in them and become like him. Through the Mass and the sacraments, Jesus makes the events from his past present. He makes those events present so that what took place in him can take place in us and we can be transformed, become like him. Through the liturgy and the sacraments, Jesus is going to take the events from his life and make them present so that we can step into them, take part in them, and become like him. That's what's happening through the Mass and the sacraments. Jesus wants to put his life in us and then relive his life in us. A few months ago, I read all the letters of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. She was the one that Jesus revealed the Sacred Heart to. And he kept telling her over and over, listen, Margaret, I want to come and live in you and through you. Would you just let me do it? And he would say to her over and over, Margaret, let me do it. See, we keep trying to do things by our own power. And we don't get very far. Christ gives us the liturgy and the sacraments to make his life present so that we can enter in and then he can live through us. And he says to us, let me do it. Our job is just to open up to the action of his grace. Now, as I said, Jesus does this principally through the liturgy but he also does it through the whole liturgical year, and that's where we'll bring it full circle at the end of this session. Now, I want you to look at the middle, the middle of 1084. The middle of 1084. There it says, The sacraments are perceptible signs, words, and actions, accessible to our human nature, and by the action of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, they make present efficaciously the grace they signify. Now, I know that's probably not a word you use very often, efficaciously. By the action of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, they make present efficaciously the grace they signify. Now, every sacrament has two parts, the matter and the form. Well, what's the matter? Well, nothing's the matter. No, that's not what I mean. The matter of the sacrament is the physical sign. So there's two parts to a sacrament the matter or the physical sign, and then the form, the words or the prayers that go along with it. So in baptism, the matter, the sign, water. And the form, the prayer, the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian formula. Or you think of the Eucharist, how the Eucharist takes up the signs of unleavened wheat and bread and wine made from grapes, and then the form, the words of consecration, this is my body given up for you. Now God prepared the world for the sacraments in a really amazing way all through the Old Testament. And I want to share with you just one instance of the way that God prepared the church and the world for the liturgy and the sacraments through all of salvation history. Now you're all familiar with the Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, in which God tells Moses, okay, you've got to tell the Israelites that if they want to be set free in Exodus 12, they have to sacrifice a lamb, they have to pour the blood of the lamb over the doorposts, and then they have to eat the lamb. And any family that takes part in the Passover ritual, their family will be spared the death of the firstborn. And they do. And the angel of death passes over, and all those who haven't taken part of this, their firstborn dies. And the Egyptians 
beg them to flee because they think they're all going to die. So the Israelites, they go out, they cross through the Red Sea, over to the other side. Exodus chapter 15 is their great song of victory. And then they turn and they head into the wilderness of sin. Pretty appropriate name, isn't it? The wilderness of sin. And that's what they encounter there, their own sin. So now they're out in the wilderness in Exodus chapter 17. They're out in the desert. And immediately they begin to complain against God because they have no water. Moses, why did you bring us out here into the desert so that we would die of thirst? Wouldn't it have been better just to die in Egypt? And Moses turns to God and says, well, what do you want me to do with these people? God says, Moses, don't freak out. It's all right. Take the staff that's in your hand and go to the rock because they stood before a large mountain of granite. Moses, take the staff. Go stand before the rock and I want you to strike the rock. So Moses does what God commands and a fountain of water flows out of the rock and they're saved from dying of thirst. From there, they immediately go to the promised land, but because they don't trust God, they won't go in. So what do you do if you're God? He can't force them. So he says, okay, turn around and go back. So they turn and they go back and they wander in the wilderness 40 years more than a generation. And by the time they reach Numbers chapter 20, they're right back at the same spot that they were in Exodus 17. And once again, they're dying of thirst. And they complain against Moses and against God. And again, Moses turns to God and says, what do you want me to do? And God says, Moses, don't you remember Exodus 17? Take your staff, Go stand before the rock, but now God does something different here. Something very different than in Exodus 17. God tells Moses, listen, you don't have to strike the rock. We already did that. Moses, now all you have to do is stand before the rock with your staff and in the presence of the signs, speak the word and the water will flow. In the presence of the sign, Moses, of the staff and the rock, all you have to do is speak the word and the water will flow. God was getting us ready for the sacraments. God was teaching them through these two events that he would take a saving event from the past and he would make it present through the sign and the word. John chapter 19, verse 34. Jesus, the rock, is struck. The Roman soldier runs his lance through the side of Christ into his sacred heart and what pours forth? Blood and water. In every mass, that event is made present. But Jesus need not be sacrificed again. That already happened. Now all the priest has to do is stand in the presence of the signs and speak the word. And that event is made present. Calvary is made present once again. And his sacred heart is opened up. And we eat and drink from his sacred heart. His body and his precious blood. We eat and drink from the rock that is Christ. This is precisely what 1085 is telling you. Think of everything that I've just told you. Keep that in mind as you read 1085. In the liturgy of the church, the Mass and the Sacraments, It is principally his own paschal mystery. You know paschal mystery means the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In the liturgy of the church, it is principally his own paschal mystery that that Christ signifies and makes present. When his hour comes, he lives out the unique event of history, which does not pass away. Jesus dies, is buried, rises from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father once for all. His paschal mystery is a real event that occurred 
in our history, but it is unique. All other historical events happen once, and then they pass away, swallowed up in the past. The Paschal mystery of Christ, by contrast, cannot remain only in the past, because all that he did and suffered for all men participates in the divine eternity, and so transcends all times while being made present in all of them. Now I want you to notice the progression of the catechism right here. Look at the heading above 1099. The heading above 1099 says, The Holy Spirit recalls the mystery of Christ. So in, in every liturgy, in every Mass, in the celebration of every sacrament, the Holy Spirit recalls the events that saved us, the saving events from the life of Christ, in the liturgy of the Word. Every Mass and every sacrament has a portion that's the liturgy of the Word where the Holy Spirit recalls the saving events from the life of Christ. And you notice in 1103 that this is called the anamnesis. Here's your word for your cocktail party this week. Anamnesis. It's the opposite of amnesia. Amnesia is to forget. The opposite of that is to remember. Anamnesis, to remember, to make remembrance. Because in every Mass, every liturgy, every sacrament, the Holy Spirit recalls the events from the life of Christ that saved us through the liturgy of the Word. And then look immediately at 1104. The Christian liturgy not only recalls the events that saves us, but actualizes them, makes them present. What? This is astounding. The Catechism is spending a lot of time to tell you that the way that Christ wants to transform you is for you to come to the liturgy and the sacraments as often as you can because he's going to make every event and stage and step of his life present there so that you can come to the liturgy and the sacraments and step into them so that he can transform you make you like him. And we've been trying to do it on our own for this long. The Paschal mystery of Christ is celebrated, not repeated. It is the celebrations that are repeated. And in each celebration, there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that makes the unique mystery present. And you know what that is? Look at my hands, palm side down. Here's your second cocktail word. Epiclesis. Epiclesis. In every Mass, in every sacrament, there is a moment in which the priest prays with his hands, two hands or one hand, palm side down, where he asks the Father to send the Holy Spirit to make the saving event from the life of Christ present. Why? So that what took place in him can take place in us right there, right now. This happens in the Mass, right before the consecration. The priest places both hands, palm side down over the gifts, and he asks the Father to send the Holy Spirit. And the bell rings. Why does the bell ring then? Because the Holy Spirit is making Calvary present. So that saving work of Christ can continue in us. And I'm always struck by that moment in reconciliation, the sacrament of reconciliation, where the priest raises his hand over your head. That's an epiclesis. And he's praying, God the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of your Son, has reconciled the world to himself, and I absolve you of your sins. Do you know what's happening when he's praying with his hands palm side down right at that moment? Calvary is being made present. The Paschal mystery, where, you know, where Jesus poured out his blood so that your sins could be forgiven. That event is being made present and you're being washed by the blood of Christ. And that didn't happen 
when you stood in line examining your conscience. It didn't happen when you had the idea that you should come to confession. It happened at that moment. It is amazing to be Catholic. Now, I don't want to drive you crazy with flipping all over the catechism, but I do want you to turn up to 1370. Just to finish off this point in 1370. The last line in 1370 really drives home this point where it says, in the Eucharist, the church is, as it were, at the foot of the cross, united to the offering and the intercession of Christ. In the Mass, you are at Calvary. Not in your mind, not in your memory, not in a figure of speech, not just in the readings, but the Holy Spirit has made that event present and you are there, united to the offering and the, inter the intercession of Christ. In fact, the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Mass, it's the same sacrifice. It's the same event. And you're there. And my friends, right there is why I'm Catholic. The preaching might be better somewhere else. The music might be better somewhere else. The fellowship might be better somewhere else, but nowhere else can you go and step into the saving event of Calvary made present so that we can stand in the fountain of grace pouring forth from his sacred heart and drink in the precious blood and the divine life of Jesus. Nowhere else. That's why I'm Catholic. Let's move on. Let's move on to the second part tonight. Let's go a little further in understanding the nature of the sacraments. I want you to turn to the in brief in 1131. 1131. This first paragraph, this first line in the in brief gives a nice summary explanation of the sacraments before we dive into them. 1131 tells us that the sacraments are efficacious signs of grace. There's that word again, efficacious. Don't worry, we're going to get to that. The sacraments are efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church through which his divine life is dispensed to us. It's a good definition of a sacrament. Now let's open this up and make it more clear. What do we mean when we say that a sacrament is an efficacious sign of grace? A sacrament is efficacious because it actually makes happen what it signifies. Now an, an ordinary sign can't do that. Think of a stop sign. A stop sign signifies, it symbolizes that we should stop. So at the, the uh, end of my street, there's a stop sign. And I have a terrible habit of just rolling through that stop sign because it's a residential road and there's not much traffic. And my, one of my kids usually reminds me, uh, Dad, that was a stop sign. And I always tell them, yeah, I know that was a stop sign. It symbolizes I should stop. It signifies that I should stop. But... For that stop sign to be efficacious, it would have to have the power to make me stop. Not only to signify it, but to make it happen in me. It would reach out and bring me to a stop. I'm kind of glad my stop sign isn't a sacrament. Sacraments, on the other hand, they are signs, but they have this extra God-given power to effect what they signify. They make happen what they symbolize. Take baptism, for instance. Water is a sign that symbolizes what? Well, it symbolizes cleansing and purification. Water symbolizes new life. 
But what if you're on the Titanic? Now what does water symbolize? Death. So baptism can also symbolize death. In baptism, the Holy Spirit makes the water efficacious so that it brings about what it signifies. We die to the old life of sin and we are cleansed from original sin and all personal sin and then we rise to the new life of Christ and we actually become children of God. And baptism is not a ritual that symbolizes something that's already happened. Everything that I just mentioned, cleansed from original sin, die to the old life, rise to the new life of God, become a child of God, that doesn't happen when the baby is conceived or born. It doesn't happen when you set the date with the parish or the priest for the baptism. It doesn't happen when you notify the godparents. It happens the moment the child is immersed in the water or the water is poured over his or her head. The sacrament, the sacrament makes it happen right then, right there. These are not empty rituals that we just hold on to. They're efficacious signs that actually do in us what they signify. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4 Paul understands this perfectly well, and he tells us about it. He tells us what happens in baptism. Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Guess what? At baptism, his death is made present, and we're inserted into it, and we die with him. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's what happens in baptism. The saving event from the past is made present through the sign and the word, the sign that is an efficacious sign of grace, makes it happen in us, right there, right then. The death and resurrection of Christ is made present so that what took place in him can take place in us right now. That's a sacrament. Now, thanks be to God, the power of a sacrament is not dependent upon the holiness of the priest. This is an important point, 1128. Paragraph 1128 tells us that the sacraments always work by virtue of the saving work of Christ. And as you go on in that paragraph, it follows that the sacrament is not wrought by the righteousness of either the celebrant or the recipient, but by the power of God. And from the moment that a sacrament is celebrated in accordance with the intention of the church, the power of Christ and his spirit acts in it and through it, independent of the personal holiness of the minister. The sacrament always works. But notice, that's not the end of this paragraph. There's a last line. Nevertheless, this is a big nevertheless. The fruits of the sacrament also depend on the disposition of the one who receives them. Christ always does what he promises to do through the sacrament. The question is, have we opened our soul have we opened the doors of our soul to receive the grace that he wants to give? Or have we closed down the doors of our soul because of our vice and our sin, our lack of a prayer life, our lack of virtue, our lack of preparation? Because the sacraments are not magic. The degree to which you are transformed is partly dependent upon how you open up to the grace of Christ. I can say this with all confidence. It is not enough for you to go to Mass every Sunday. It's not enough for you to go to Mass every day. Because if we don't open our soul through a deeper life of prayer, through the practice of penance and self-denial, rooting out 
our venial sins and then practicing the opposite virtues, then that grace of Christ that comes to us in the sacrament will just merely bounce off our hardened hearts. They're not magic. St. Augustine said God created you without you, but he can't save you without you. You've got to participate in your own rescue. It was true what he said to Margaret Mary, let me do it. And Margaret spoke over and over and over in her letters about how her job was to open up to the grace. That's her role. That's our role. And that which unleashes, that which opens up the doors of the soul and unleashes the grace in our lives better than anything else is a deep life of prayer. A deep life of prayer. If we want the sacraments to, to transform us, we've got to be men and women of deep prayer. You know, honestly, there's enough grace in one Eucharist to make us a saint. Because the Eucharist is Jesus, and he's infinite. There's an infinite amount of grace in one Eucharist. How many of you have received at least one Eucharist in your life? Well, what's wrong with you? You're not saints yet? Where's the problem lie? On God's side or ours? So what can we do to, to open up to this grace? The first step is a deeper life of prayer. It's shown powerfully in the baptism of Jesus. Luke chapter 3 tells us that he was praying and then the heavens were opened up and the Holy Spirit fell upon him. Acts chapter 1 tells us that Mary and the apostles were praying before Pentecost and then the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Prayer opens the doors of the soul so that the grace of the liturgy and the sacraments can come in and transform you. Now, I'm not just talking about saying prayers. There's three stages of prayer. We'll go in depth in this in the last part of the catechism, but I don't want to wait till then. There are three stages in the growth of prayer. Vocal prayer, meditation, contemplation. We teach, young, we teach young children vocal prayer. The Hail Mary, the Our Father, prayers of the Mass. And then we as adults never go any further. We say these prayers, we talk to God in our own words, but we never listen to God. Meditation is opening up and listening. So we've got to go on from vocal prayer to meditation. We've got to go on where we will set aside time every day in solitude and in silence where, yes, we talk to God in our own words. But then we need to listen to Him. So we open Scripture and we read His life, His teachings, His actions. And we spend time thinking about them, reflecting on them. But it's not even enough to do this. If all we do is read about his life and then leave it aside and never think about it again, we lead a compartmentalized life. I've got my prayer life here and then I've got the rest of my life over here and they don't merge. This is why we need a resolution. Not only meditation where we read and reflect, but also a resolution where we do the best that we can to remember our meditation all day long, or at least some point from our meditation, because this remembrance of the words and the actions of Christ, this remembrance will change the way we think and the way we act. And that's how we're transformed. Now what do you think would happen to a person who if he or she would spend time every day in silence and solitude reading the life of Christ from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, thinking about it, reflecting on it, and then doing the best he or she could throughout the day just to keep that in mind. What do you think would happen to that person over a month? 
Do you think they'd grow a little? Do you think they'd change for the better? And what would happen to that person if they'd do it for six months? Six months of spending time every day reading, thinking about the life of Jesus, holding those things that he said and did in their mind, carried them with them through the day. What do you think that person would look like after six months, a year? will change. will change for good. And there's really two options. The saints tell us either we do this and we change or we won't do it. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. This has to be the corresponding piece that goes along with the sacraments. Because quite honestly, both you and I know people who have gone to Mass every week of their life, maybe daily Mass most of their life, and they haven't grown a lick in virtue. There's a problem with that. Because we need this corresponding piece of daily deeper prayer where we open the doors of the soul, let the grace come in, and then we cooperate with that grace through our free will. This second piece is as important as the first, and they go hand in hand together. Hand in hand together. As you turn to 1163, not only in each Mass, in each celebration of the sacraments, does Jesus make the saving events from his life present so that what took place in him can take place in us, but he wants to relive his whole life through every liturgical year. Through the, as the whole church calendar unfolds, he wants to relive every step of his life so that we can enter in with him through the whole liturgical year and be transformed. Look at 1163. 1163, Holy Mother Church believes that she should celebrate the saving work of her divine spouse in a sacred commemoration on certain days throughout the course of the year. Once each week on the day which she is called the Lord's Day, she keeps the memory of the Lord's resurrection. She also celebrates it once every year together with his blessed passion at Easter, that most solemn of all feasts. And then I want you to underline this line. In the course of the year, moreover, she unfolds the whole mystery of Christ. Throughout the liturgical year, the whole life of Christ unfolds. Throughout the liturgical year, the whole life of Christ is made present so that we can enter in and be transformed. The liturgical year is a reliving of the life of Christ so that we can enter in and be transformed. That paragraph goes on, thus recalling the mysteries of the redemption, she opens up to the faithful the riches of the Lord's powers and merits so that these are in some way made present in every age. All these stages of the life of Christ are made present through the liturgical year. He's reliving his life so that we can enter in and be transformed. And I I don't think too often we pay attention to how the whole liturgical year unfolds. We just think it's random. The church is just throwing out all these different readings. And I don't know, does it have any rhyme or reason to it? Or, or are we just showing up and listening to things? We have to stand back and look at the whole big picture and see, oh, that's every step of the life of Christ. I get to live, relive every year. So we begin... usually the end of November, the beginning of December, with Advent, where we are making ready for the Messiah, right there with Mary and Joseph, that first Advent. We're told to prepare the way of the Lord. And then right in the first part of Advent, we always have December 8th, the Immaculate Conception. And the liturgy gives us Luke chapter 1, verse 28, the Annunciation. Hail, full of grace. And the word is conceived within her. And then she begins that great advent over nine months preparing for the birth of Christ. And we have four 
Sundays in Advent, we meet the forerunner, John the Baptist, and then we're told with Joseph by the angel, don't be afraid. And then we celebrate the birth of Christ on December 25th. And Christmas goes all the way up to January 6th. Don't take your Christmas tree down on the 26th. I don't want to drive by your houses and see them out on the curb. If I do, I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to go knock on your door. You keep it all the way up until January 6th because this is the, the Christmas season. We've got we to gotta celebrate it. And in the middle of the Christmas season, we have the Holy Innocents, all those little children who died because of Christ. And the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and what they teach us in the silence there at the home of Nazareth. And then January 1st, we kick off the secular new year with the Mother of God. I love January 1st because January 1st of every year, we look into that new year and it's black. We can't see what's out there. And there's a hand that comes through that darkness and reaches out, and it's a mother's hand. And she says, take my hand, I'll take you all the way through this year. We don't have to be afraid. Then we come to the Epiphany, January 6th, the end of Christmas, and the Adoration of the Magi, and that's followed immediately the next week with the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus, his baptism, and the wedding of Cana. John the Baptist points out he's the Messiah. Follow him. Jesus begins his public ministry. Repent and believe. And then we have the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount and all the teaching of Jesus unfold. And then we come to Ash Wednesday. I've always found it funny that Ash Wednesday is not a holy day of obligation and yet the churches are packed. It's kind of like you give something away for free and people come. You know, we're going to give away ashes, dirt. Hey, guess what? Catholic Church, we're giving away dirt and everyone comes. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen, but, but it's the Holy Spirit working within us, leading us. You know, what, you know what Lent is? The Holy Spirit leading us to enter in to Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. We're entering into his 40 days in the wilderness and taking part with him by prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And the 40 days of Lent, we go through this time united to the temptations of Jesus, but we get moments of consolation. March 19th, the Feast of St. Joseph. The Feast of St. Joseph. Then the Transfiguration. The woman at the well. Jesus heals the blind man, raises Lazarus. These are the events that take us through Lent. And again, another moment of consolation. March 25th, nine months before Christmas, the Annunciation we celebrate. Then finally, the sixth Sunday of Lent is Palm Sunday, and we begin Holy Week, and we enter into the great three days, the Triduum, Holy Thursday, where the Last Supper is made present, Good Friday, the death, the suffering and death of Christ. Holy Saturday, we enter in to the tomb with Jesus. You know, Holy Saturday should be a day of great silence because God was silent that day as he was in the tomb. And then the great Sunday, Easter, the resurrection, and then we celebrate Easter for seven Sundays, 49 days, 50th day, finally, Pentecost, Pentecost. But all the way through, we have these great events that are unfolding. The visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, May 31st. How many of you have ever celebrated May 31st and said to your friends, hey, I'll buy you lunch today because guess what? Today is the Feast of the Visitation. And they'll say, what? Like, I, it doesn't matter. You buy me lunch, I'm fine with that. <laughs> but we should know the events that are unfolding so that we can enter in and so that we can share them with others. Then we enter into ordinary time, the birthday of John the Baptist. There's only three people we celebrate birthdays in the liturgical year. John the Baptist, Jesus, Christmas, Mary. Mary, her birthday on September 8th, Mary's birthday. You should celebrate their birthdays. Have a birthday cake. Have a birthday celebration. See, my kids, once I told them about this, that we should 
feast when the church feasts and fast when the church fasts. Then my kids were finding all these obscure saints to celebrate. There was one for every day. Not only should we celebrate when the church celebrates, but we also have to enter into the penitential times. Two times of purple in our liturgical year. Advent and Lent. Two times of penance and preparation. Not just one. And Advent isn't just a time to figure out who you're going to get what for Christmas presents. The physical and a spiritual preparation. But as we go through the, the ordinary time in the summer, we have great feasts, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, followed immediately the next day by the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Then all through the ordinary time, we have all the parables, the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the weeds and the wheat, the parable of the pearl of great price, his miracles, the multiplication of the loaves, Jesus walking on water, casting out demons, calming the sea. Because the miracles show us that Jesus has power over everything. I can trust him because he has power over everything. Then we come to August 15th and we celebrate the Assumption of Mary. And do you know what comes seven days later? What comes seven days after the Feast of the Assumption? Well, the 22nd. That's what seven days later. Not just the 22nd. It's the queenship of Mary. She's assumed into heaven and then crowned queen of the whole universe. I have a queen whom I try to serve. It's Mary. And I celebrate her coronation on August 22nd. But as we continue through the liturgical year, Jesus is reminding us that if we want to be his disciple, we too have to take up our cross and follow him. And we see him giving to the apostles the power to bind and loose in confession. And he tells us that God will only forgive us as we've forgiven others. And then as we get closer to the end of the liturgical year, we have to start preparing for the return of Christ the King. And we have the workers in the vineyard and the parable of the talents and the wise, the virgins, the wise virgins. All these parables tell us to, to get ready again because... We are waiting for the return of Christ the King. We are all looking forward to the return of Christ the King. And that's the liturgical year. Our lives should revolve around the liturgical year. Do you know what our lives revolve around? Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, ah, uh, then the big holiday, Super Bowl. And then, not Lent, but March Madness. March Madness. And then spring break, graduation, summer vacation, ah, school starts again. Now, these are all good things. Don't get me wrong. But our lives should revolve around Christ and the unfolding of His life through the liturgical year. But isn't it interesting? How will we even know if we're not doing two things, participating regularly in the Mass and the Sacraments and spending time in meditation reading the readings from the Mass. Look how they go hand in hand to transform our life. What a great plan God has given us. It's great to be Catholic, isn't it? Let's conclude with a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you that you've given us the liturgy, the mass, the sacraments, the liturgical year, and we beg you to give us a burning desire to really enter into these, to pay attention to them, to allow our lives to be transformed by these. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you next time.